get off that easy. I was going to shake that hand of yours. Alan, it's good to see you again, buddy. God bless you. Are you having an awesome time at the Western Conservative Summit? If you aren't, you've got to be taking a pill or comatose or something or smoking whatever they smoke out here in Colorado. All I know is I am grateful to be here and the house is going to rock tonight. Are you ready? I am so thrilled because as I look out at your beautiful faces and I see all of the candles that are lit, it really is the candle that we hold up, the candle for hope and brilliance in the future. And I am thrilled that I had the privilege to be in the United States Congress. I am completing my eighth year. It's been a wonderful ride and I can't believe all that's transpired and all that's happened in the last eight years. It really has been a privilege. And during the course of that time, life was busy and it kept getting busier and busier and busier. And when President Obama came into office, it really got busy. We had to double down. And uh, in the last four years, I was also privileged to be uh, chosen to sit on the Intelligence Committee. The Intelligence Committee deals with the classified secrets of our nation. It primarily deals with the issue of terrorism. Unfortunately, we're all too well acquainted with that, and that especially in the last week or so. We've seen more tragedy than any of us would ever want to see during the course of a lifetime. But in that committee, it is the only committee where each person on that committee, it's a very small committee for obvious reasons, but it is chosen by the Speaker of the House. And we take that charge very seriously, and I think that you'll be encouraged to hear that this is probably, perhaps, the most bipartisan committee in Congress. You'd be hard-pressed to know who's a Democrat and who's a Republican in this committee. And the reason for that is this. Everything is at stake. Everything. I had a speech that I had written, and when the last two weeks came around, I couldn't give it. I couldn't do jokes, and I couldn't speak to you in the way that I had intended. I spent virtually all of my time down in the basement of the Capitol, locked up in what we call the skiff, where we go for our briefings. Literally four and five times a day, we're called down to the skiff because of the obvious events that have been going on. And as I thought about that, I pondered and pondered, there is so much I want to tell you. There's so much that I think that you need to know. Because in the last eight years, scant little has been paid attention to America's national security, certainly in my opinion by our president. And even less intelligence has been paid to foreign policy. And even in the presidential election, I was dismayed how little time and attention was paid to national security interests. I knew this was a big, important issue. I knew that we had to talk about the imminent threat of a nuclear Iran and that we had to do everything within our power to make sure that the enemy terrorist state of Iran never, ever, ever obtains a nuclear weapon. And as we seek to do the right thing, that will be our goal, to make sure that that never happens. But in the midst of thinking of all of that, the question that I asked myself was this, and it was quite simply, what is it that makes greatness for a nation? What is it that makes a nation great? And I think that's why we're here tonight. Because as I told my colleagues, Alan will remember this. We have a thing called Republican Conference. Once a week, we get together. And as we got together one week, I went to the microphone and I said to the other Republicans, I think what's going to be on the ballot this fall is going to be not just the dealing with the border and not just Obamacare. I think what's going to be on the ballot this fall for the American people is the issue of fear. Because I think the American people are fearful that this great nation that they would willingly die for 
is literally vaporizing before their eyes. And they want to know, are we going to man up and fight for them? Because we are all that they have. We're it. And if we fail to take that charge, we fail in our responsibility, not only to our constituents, but we fail the sacred memory of those who brought us this unparalleled gift. And so as you look at America, we are at, at once one of the youngest constitutional republics in the world. And yet, in a relatively short period of time, we went literally from clearing trees and plowing the land to create a crop of corn to get us through a winter of starvation to unparalleled economic growth, to invention and human happiness that has rivaled any other nation on the face of the earth. And so I asked myself, how did it happen and why? And that's what a young Frenchman, if any of you have seen that great movie by Dinesh D'Souza called America, it's a fabulous movie. If you haven't seen Dinesh's movie, you have to go and see it and you have to buy it when it comes out on DVD. And he opens with a young Frenchman named Alec de Tocqueville. And de Tocqueville wanted to find out, what is this new nation? And he spent months traversing our young country, investigating the secret to America's newfound success. And de Tocqueville found it. And he concluded quite convincingly that America was great because America was good. And the good that he found was found in the Judeo-Christian pulpits of the United States of America. Because it was there at those pulpits which were alive with preaching the good news of God's creative order, of man's fall, and God's redemptive answer, and the life of joy and happiness and personal responsibility that follows therefrom. You see, America was great because of the teaching of moral accountability. The founders understood that our freedoms rested clearly on the concept of self-control. And all that means is we just control ourselves. We control our ability to control ourselves. And if men and women could control themselves, then the society could function, we could organize, we could enjoy the fruits of our labor, and the peace that so many of us in this room grew up with in this magnificent country would be ours for the next generation. You see, a nation also has a robust economic engine. A nation can't be great without a great economy. And we achieved that in record time by the late 19th century. We were the leaders of the world. A great nation has to be able to secure her people's safety. That's the first duty of government. But thankfully, our geography, our policies, our military preparedness, our growth, made safety a reality that almost came so easily that our nation seemingly took it for granted. And out of our economic abundance, our prosperity, our great nation brought humanitarian assistance to every corner of the globe. And we shared the good news with every tribe. Even those who didn't have a language, we wrote their language for them so that we could present the good news to those people and tribes. Our aircraft carrier was the first on the scene after the Japanese nuclear disaster at Fukushima. It was America that rebuilt Europe. It was America that rebuilt Japan after we defeated their aggression in World War II. And we fed, and we housed, and we helped heal Southeast Asia after the devastating tsunami that literally consumed millions, thousands of lives. And after Haiti lost over 500,000 of her people in an earthquake, we were there, and we're still there in that country. We routinely feed them who suffer from famine. We are the largest donor to the UN, although I would advocate getting out of that organization. We are the largest donor to the UN in every possible capacity. It is the America that pays 
for those who suffer from AIDS in Africa, whether they're adults or whether they're children. And despite closed international doors and human trafficking rings, it is America who continually opens the door to facilitate the international adoption of children who need and deserve a mom and a dad. It's the United States that's the leading producer of intelligence, which we willingly share with our foreign partners so they can keep their people safe, too. We train medical personnel, and we build the finest medical system in the world, bar none. And even Obamacare, I believe, which will be repealed, will not defeat the world's finest health care system. Just to give you an example of American pluck, in the 1950s, there was a gentleman named Earl Bakken who went to his garage every afternoon in Maplewood, Minnesota, in his backyard. And Earl tinkered around as he always did. And one day, Earl invented something that was called the pacemaker. That pacemaker became Medtronic, one of the largest medical device companies in the world. Medtronic because Earl Bakken went to his backyard and tinkered in his, his, in his garage as a great innovator. Another Iowan in Minnesota, Norman Borlaug, literally saved over one billion. You heard me right. Norman Borlaug, an innocent, unassuming guy from Iowa and Minnesota, saved over one billion human lives. How is that possible, Michelle? Well, Norman Borlaug was a genius when it came to reproducing seeds. And Norman Borlaug worked and worked and failed and failed and tried again and tried again. And ultimately, he created a strain of seed, both wheat and, and rice, that could produce literally in almost any soil in the world. And across the world, he saved over one billion lives. We train medical personnel, personnel for other nations. We set up health care clinics. We educate girls who never before were allowed to see the inside of a school. We also allow one million people to come into this country legally every year. And I'm told that the United States of America is so generous in our legal immigration process that we allow in more immigrants into the United States in one year than all of the other nations of the world combined. That's what we do. So don't say that we don't do enough when it comes to immigration. America didn't become great by accident. You see, we didn't become great because we stole our greatness from any other nation. We need to give credit where credit is due. It's our forebears who earned the greatness of our nation. They fought for it. They live lives worthy of us to emulate them. And we stand on the shoulders of giants, legendary brave men on the field of battle, from Washington's revolutionary army, fighting an impossible battle against the world's greatest, strongest, most powerful army. Let that be a lesson to us. To the Doolittle Raid after we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, to the beaches of Normandy 70 years ago, when we had, when never had so much, so many given so much to liberate a continent that was ensnared by the insane, murderous grip of a madman, to the sacrifices made even day, today on the battlefields of Afghanistan. One week ago today, I stood on the air deck of the USS Teddy Roosevelt, one of our 10 aircraft carriers that we station across the world. I will tell you, it is some of the four most important acres of American sovereign soil that we can have anywhere. Thank God for America's military. Thank God for what we give to the world. My dad was proudly serving in the United States Air Force here in the great state of Colorado where he bravely served and honorably served at Lowry Air Force Base. My brother was born at Fitzsimmons Hospital. My mom worked in Littleton, Colorado, where, by the way, she shook the hand. She was a Democrat at the time. She shook the hand of President Eisenhower, and the woman became a Republican. 
83 and still votes right. And that's why I believe that American soldiers' lives must never be squandered. They must, their sacrifices must never be cheapened by the political decisions made by a commander-in-chief for the purpose of reflecting their hard-earned glory onto his shallow political aspirations, that occupant of the White House. Great men don't reach for another man's glory. In humility, they pay homage, and they freely give the respect that's due to the real her hero, the American soldier, our veterans. And a great president wouldn't tolerate 500 veterans grievously injured or dead at the hands of a VA health care system that negligently delivered death to them rather than healing life to them. You see, the United Kingdom was once the great economic and military powerhouse of the world. They held the title of economic powerhouse until we overtook them over 100 years ago. Our economic clout is what paid for our military clout. And never forget it. Because you see, without being the economic leader of the world, it is virtually impossible to be the military powerhouse of the world. And it was our economic advantage that President Reagan engaged to defeat the former Soviet Union in the Cold War without firing a shot. That victory began like all great endeavors, with nearly next to nothing. My favorite American heroes of all are the pilgrims. Because you see, when the pilgrims braved the, the, the weather and the elements to arrive in cold Massachusetts, they were indentured servants to those who financed their passage and paid for them to begin. The first year that the pilgrims were here, half of them died that winter. They spent years upon years paying back for the privilege of coming to the United States of America. They were shorted over and cheated over and over by people in England. But such was their character, such was the greatness of their Judeo-Christian worldview, that they made a decision that they would be debtors to no man. They would live upright, righteous lives. They would be the shining city on the hill. Their lives would be what would become eventually the greatness that we emulate today in America. That's where the essence of America began, with their work ethic, with their thrift, with their pluck, with their per perseverance. They very quickly built out the idea of American exceptionalism. They made us the envy of the world with their reputation. We were based on a meritocracy, not an aristocracy, which led to explosive growth and innovation. And as America uh, needed to grow with invention and prosperity, it caused the rest of the world to rise up and the rest of the world to succeed. And that followed with improved standard of living and a quality of life that had never before been seen in 5,000 years of human history. You see, tonight, here in Denver, we are enjoying the greatest prosperity that anyone in 5,000 years of human history has ever known for the general people in a society. We get that privilege today. That's what, part, that's what fuels our thankfulness. Each generation became infused with an optimism and a near certainty that they would outperform their parents and their grandparents. And Americans were generally unwilling to take from their neighbors what they could do for themselves. Does that begin to acquaint us, reacquaint us just a little bit with who we really are? And when we view the cultivated gift that America has been to us and to the world, with unashamed, grateful hearts, we cry out with thankfulness to those who gave so much to us with so little thought to the sacrifice to themselves. I think of my own parents, my own grandparents, my own great-grandparents. You see, it's our forebears who counted themselves lucky and saw it their duty to make sure that our way was made better than theirs so that we could have more than they did. It's their greatness 
of, of America and the desire to faithfully pass the torch to this generation and to the next as our parents did for us, I think that explains why we are here in this room tonight. And I think it explains why we are so determined that this ex experiment in liberty will not fail on our watch. And I also think that it explains why we are so determined to see that after the first Tuesday in November, Harry Reid is no longer the majority leader of the United States Senate and that Cory Gardner is the next Colorado senator from this state. I serve with Cory. From the first day he came in, I contest this is a man you want for your next U.S. senator. Bye-bye, Mark Udall. Your time is done. And while we're at it, we're doing our best to elect Mike McFadden in the state of Minnesota because I think it's time that Al Franken takes a retirement card, too. And I think it explains why we're willing to get up in the middle of the night and make phone calls and give money and go to door to door, talk to our neighbors, and not be silent about this election or about the one coming up in 2016. And it explains why I think we do what that children's storybook says, that we think like the little engine that could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. We keep at it, we keep at it, even when it looks like we can't do it. That's what Norman Borlaug did, and he saved a billion people's lives. That's what Earl Bakken did, and he gave the world the heart pacemaker. That's what the pilgrims did, and they gave you the shining city on the hill. That's what Ronald Reagan did, and he defeated the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And we can defeat the forces of dark totalitarianism again today. Believe it. We can do it. I believe we will make it happen because, you see, we have no choice. We have present challenges that America can't escape. In addition to nearly doubling America's entire national debt, due in large part to the feckless, dangerous actions, words, and lack of action by our president, America and our allies today are in the midst of a very challenging national security environment. And that's what I want to speak to you about for just a few minutes. In this past week alone, Thousands of anti-Israel protesters from France to the United Kingdom to Germany are violently denouncing Israel for defending herself from thousands of incoming rockets launched at Jewish and Arab civilians by the murderous Ar Iranian-backed Muslim Brotherhood army called Hamas. When 13 terrorists climbed through a Gaza tunnel, and there's a whole network of them, and they have to come down. They have to be bulldozed. They have to go away. When 13 terrorists climbed through a Gaza tunnel headed for an Israeli kibbutz this week with the intent of mass murder of innocent civilians, Israel was forced to act. After continually warning the Palestinian residents with leaflets, with door-to-door -door efforts, through advanced warning phone calls, through text messages of explaining an impending military action, the Israelis acted in self-defense. The fact is, if the Muslim Brotherhood Hamas would drop their guns and weapons, there would be peace. If Israel drops her defensive weapons, there will be no more Israel. As the Prime Minister Netanyahu said, Israel has missiles to protect her people. Hamas has people to protect her missiles. Hamas moves terrorists in Gaza in ambulances filled with children. There isn't a moral equivalency here between the two parties. This isn't just another cycle of violence. Gaza's main industry is the export of terrorism and the domestic distribution of hatred to its children against the Jewish people. You see, here is the mission statement, and I want you to listen very carefully. 
This is the mission statement of the violent brother, Muslim Brotherhood, and it's this. Allah is our objective. The messenger is our leader. The Quran is our law. Jihad is our way. Dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. All over the world, followers of the Muslim Brotherhood are dying this week and furthering their death wish, not only against Israel, but Boko Haram in Nigeria just killed 20 yesterday in an unprotected village made up of innocent civilians, primarily Christians. They've killed 14,000 innocent people, primarily Christians, in the last three years alone. That's just Boko Haram. This killing, while I said it's primarily directed against Christians, it is also directed against Muslims, innocent Muslims, who are considered apostate Muslims. The Islamic State, if you've heard of this new group called ISIS, they now call themselves the Islamic State, they say that they are the new caliphate, the new global rulers of the Muslim people. Then the new caliph, in, they are now located in Iraq and Syria, it's led by the new self-described Osama bin Laden of today. His name is Baghdadi. He is 43 years old. He, is, he has a master's degree. He has a doctorate degree. He is a long-term veteran of this jihadist war. When the very first affiliate of Al-Qaeda was set up, it was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He was number three in that, in, in that division for years. The United States of America took out number one and took out number two. He became number one. And then he broke with Al-Qaeda and decided he is the most pure vision and as a direct descendant of Muhammad, of Muhammad's tribe, he has made himself the caliph and has established the caliphate in Syria and Iraq. He has millions of dollars. This has never happened before. He has millions of dollars. Some reports say over $400 million to finance terrorist jihad. We have never seen this before. He got it by robbing banks in northern Iraq. He has oil fields to sustain his revenue to continue and further global jihad. In less than one month's time, in an unparalleled blitz, blitzkrieg, the Islamic State took control of eastern Syria and northern and western Iraq. And they are now trying to consolidate their gains. He got his army by emptying prisoners made up of murdering terrorists. And he reportedly has thousands in his army, 10,000 in his army. And, for, and, and increasing numbers of terrorists are joining his ranks. Yesterday, Baghdadi's army killed 115 in central Syria when they took control of gas field. They run electric plants. They know what they're doing. They have over 100 jihadist fighters with United States passports. This has never happened before. Jihadists fighting in the epicenter of jihad with U.S. passports. The fear being that they will learn their carnage and come back to the United States with U.S. passports and, and complete carnage here in the United States. There are over 1,000 1, jihadists with European passports. Baghdadi announced that they intend to bring jihad to Europe and also to the United States. He said they will try any number of terror attacks pointed against innocent people, including very clever, new, never seen before attacks on the West aviation system. So what we saw this week could be but a pre precursor to what is yet to come. The world you see is upended. And why? You see, the greatness of America is no longer upheld by a lawless president. And it is my opinion 
that the legacy of Barack Obama will be the establishment of lawlessness in the United States. But in 1968, 19, uh, 2016, in 2016, that legacy will end. It will end. And lawfulness will return to our country. Baghdadi and the United States and the Islamic State are emboldened. They're well funded. They're well armed. They're highly trained. They have the most sophisticated social media recruitment tools anyone has ever seen before, and written in various languages of the West, including English. And they have very strong videos, too, that are enticing young people to come and join the jihad. And most importantly, the Islamic State is convinced and confident of their cause to force Muslims and non-Muslim compliance with 7th century Islamic law, and they will kill anyone with any means to achieve this goal. Unlike our President's handling of terror, whether from a nuclear-capable Iran, which the President is clearly enabling with yesterday's quiet announcement, I'm not sure if you heard, but the President of the United States announced he's going to give Iran another four months reprieve in addition to the eight he's already given them to continue to develop their nuclear weapon program. He says he's not, but I assure you he is. Our Pentagon admits that Iran will have intercontinental ballistic missile capability by 2015. That's six months from now. To have a nuclear weapon, Iran needs fissile material. They have nine to ten tons. That's enough for multiple nuclear weapons. That's more than enough, albeit it must be in the proper form. Iran already has a missile delivery system that reaches to Israel. But what Iran knows is they first need to defeat the great Satan, the United States, before they can defeat the little Satan, Israel. Hence, their mad dash to have the ICBM, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, delivery system that will come to us. And finally, they need the nuclear warhead. And that R&D is continuing. And also quietly this week, you may have read yesterday, that the man who is most assuredly behind the cold-blooded murder of 298 souls aboard the Malaysian airliner this week struck a deal with the terrorist state of Iran for $1.2 billion to trade good for oil, goods for oil. And who knows? I'm just speculating. If some of that, through, if some of that trade, whether with Russia or China or North Korea, could possibly include nuclear warheads. Who knows? Know-how or parts. But should we take the chance? This clear and near certain danger of a nuclear Iran with the stated intention that they will use a nuclear weapon to defeat the West and Israel would tell any thinking president concerned for the safety of the American people and of innocents across the globe this. If he has the capability to take out this nuclear program, the President of the United States of America should no longer delay because the Iranians will not end their nuclear ambitions. We have to use every capability in our arsenal, including the nuclear option, to end this nuclear nightmare for them. And if I were President and I tried, I would have done it a long time ago. And the one bright light in the Middle East, Egypt, which is now seen controlled by the violent Muslim Brotherhood, rested away and by the Egyptian people who literally went by the tens of the millions in the streets to oust the violent Muslim Brotherhood, put in place President Sisi. Under his leadership, he has been clearing out the tunnels and securing the Sinai region for, for Israel. The Apache helicopters and the parts that he needs are sitting at Fort Hood. Well, the United States said we would give them, and President Obama is keeping them at Fort Hood. We need to give him those to take out terrorist cells. The terrorist cell, uh, the terrorists call their organizations by different names, but these organizations are all children of the mission statement of the terror organization, the Muslim Brotherhood. Dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. And while the recent events that we have seen in these last few weeks are terrifying, I'm here to tell you tonight, do not fear.
fear because our forebears did not fear. Recall, recall that one of the West's forebears was a man named Charles Martel. He stopped the invading Islamist terrorists at the gates of Vienna. The terrorists were defeated not once, they were defeated there twice, and Christendom and Western civilization survived, and it blessed the world. The Ottoman Empire collapsed at the conclusion of World War I, but the Muslim Brotherhood reconstituted itself in 1928 in their quest to fulfill their death wish. And in the 1940s and in the 1950s, right here in your beautiful state, the colorful Colorado. In the 40s and 50s, there was a man named Saeed Khatub, and he came to study at your university at Greeley, Colorado. You see, Saeed Khatub was offended by our Western culture, and he was no fan of embracing diversity of thought against Islamic Sharia law. Saeed Khatub wrote a book that was called Milestones. It is considered the seminal work of the modern terrorist jihadists, wherein he advocated for violent jihad. Khatab is the modern father of the present day Islamic slaughter that ended the lives of 3,000 Americans on 9-1-1. This dark totalitarian nightmare is our present day reality. So let us ask ourselves this very important question. How would Washington have responded? Or Lincoln? Where is our Churchill today, our Thatcher, and our Reagan? I say to you, look no further. They're here. They're here tonight in this room. And they're, here, they're attending not only here, but they are attending t-ball games tonight. They're waiting on tables tonight. And like you, they love our country more than they love their own life. And you see, I think it's that love. I think it's that confidence. And I think it's that certainty of America's greatness that it will continue. I think it's that what is going to see us through all of this and get us to the other side. And that's why I say to you all with complete confidence, God bless you. God bless the United States of America because this too we will overcome. Thank you for allowing me to come, and God bless your conference team. Michelle Bachman, our heroine, Congresswoman Minnesota, first speaker, first summit, welcome back, Western Conservative Summit 2014. Michelle, thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, be seated. Michelle Bachman helped us establish the tradition that is the Western Conservative Summit, five years and counting and growing and spreading its wings like those eagle sculptures we've seen, that real eagle that was with us tonight. We want to start a new tradition, which will carry forward annually at the summit, with an award for national leadership. Some of you know Centennial Institute presents a Colorado Leadership Award annually around Christmas. It's called, appropriately, since we're thinking of the mountain skyline, the summit, it's called the Zebulon Pike Award for Colorado Leadership in Fidelity to Jeffersonian Principles. Honorees have included the Honorable Mike Kopp, our friend Jeff Coors, the Honorable Bob Beaupre. Tonight, with a national perspective, as the Western Conservative Summit has taken on national reach, we feel honored that someone of the stature of Congresswoman Michelle Bachman consents to be our first honoree for what we will call in recognition of a man who not only put his name on a great Colorado summit, but who also interestingly explored the headwaters of the Mississippi in your state of Minnesota, Michelle. We're going to call it the Stephen H. Long Award 
Major Long of the U.S. Army, the Stephen H. Long Award for Visionary Leadership in Service to the American Idea. Michelle, we're very glad to present you with the first annual Stephen H. Long Award for Visionary Leadership in Service to the American Idea. Thank you. And, and just to keep it light, and one of the things that we do at the Western Conservative Summit is we never let it get too heavy for too long. Michelle, to ornament your congressional office for the months that remain, and the place is going to be at a loss as you depart for what we think will be yet another wonderful chapter of your service, your life, and your career. We're eager to know what that might be. We want you to have a portrait. We can't get the slide up for you tonight. I'll put it out on Twitter. This is Joan of Arc, Michelle Bachman as Joan of Arc, with the sword, with the eyes gazing heavenward. I'll take it's it. Kind of fun. I'll take it. Thank you, John. Thank you, John Thank Thank you all. Well, the beat goes on. Five blocks west, Belco Theater. The program with some entertainment will start in about 15 minutes at 7 o'clock, but fear not, there's plenty of time for you to be there in time for the opening speaker, who will be Dennis Prager of Salem Radio, and we'll be putting Dennis on about 7.30, so there's an opportunity to make your way over there if you want to walk your dinner off. It's a pleasant summer evening, five easy blocks. Or there's the pedicab fleet downstairs, our courtesy shuttle. Just give the driver a gratuity, the, the peddler. There's also an ordinary, old-fashioned, dull, boring, comfortable bus that will shuttle you over there as well. And I repeat, there's plenty of time for everybody to get there. As our gold summit guests, there's reserved seating for you in the front of the hall. It'll be kept for you as we make our way over there. With that. We thank Anthony Kearns, we thank Pastor Navarro, we thank Sean Welcome, Peter Boyles, and above all, our Stephen H. Long leadership honoree, Michelle Bachman. We are adjourned over to the Belco Theater. Thank you all very much. <laughs>